So um, again, circuit simulation with LT spice. LT spice is a flavor of spice, and spice has quite a bit of history. It goes back to 1973. Back then, um, it, it, that's even true today. If you build something on a breadboard, uh, you put a few transistors on it, a few resistors, capacitors, hook it up to power. Uh, you can measure on it with your oscilloscope. We can use voltmeters, uh, current meters, and we can figure out what's going on in that circuit. The problem is if you're building integrated circuits, that's not that easy. Uh, you need really, really tiny probes and uh, <laughs> hopefully your hands are really, really steady. Um, but all joking aside, when you create an integrated circuit, you want to have a way to simulate that before you spend a boatload of money on actually producing your first part. And this is where SPICE came in. A SPICE was created to simulate integrated circuits. And um, back then, just like what we've learned about uh, NEC, uh, NEC, the antenna simulation program, it was all done with punch cards. And um, you would submit, first of all, you would punch your cards, you would submit a stack of cards uh, to the mainframe operator, then come back the next day and pick up yards and yards of printout, ASCII printouts. And then you would go through these printouts only to find out that you made a mistake correct the mistake, submit your punch cards again, wait another day, get another 100 yards of printout, uh, and all your charts and tables would be in ASCII. So there was no graphical user interface. There was no easy way of uh, saying, oh, shoot, I wanted to have this value and not that value. Uh, you would have to rerun the whole thing. So Fast forward to today, uh, over the years, we had many different versions of SPICE that uh, came. And uh, with LT SPICE, we have something that is actually very uh, slick and uh, easy to use. It has a nice user interface. And as you will see when we actually uh, get to use it, it's really easy to decide on the fly what you actually want to know about your circuit. And it also doesn't take a day until you get your results. We as hobbyists get to take advantage of it, all of this. Uh, even though we are not creating integrated circuits, we still get to take advantage of uh, what uh, functionality is built into this really powerful tool. And we can just simulate one transistor amplifiers, or uh, we can make it as complex as we want. When I first got into SPICE, this was after punch cards, I was using a SPICE uh, version on an IBM PC. It was still on ASCII, and I still had to print out ASCII charts if I wanted to have something resembling a graphic uh, output. So you will see this is a lot better today. There are other packages besides SPICE when it comes to circuit simulation. Today, we want to focus on SPICE because it's readily available. LT SPICE is free. Um, but just uh, to give you an idea of what else is out there, LZ is an interesting tool. It's uh, used, it's designed for and used for uh, designing and simulating LC filters, inductors and capacitors, LC. See where the name comes from, LC. Uh, so uh, it, it's a great tool if you want to build a bandpass filter, a low pass filter, high pass filter, notch filter, any type of filter. You plug what you wanna, want it to do into LC and out comes a circuit and then you can play around with that. Uh, there is a hobbyist version that's available for free. You just go to this website, download, and run it. And if you want to use this in a professional environment uh, outside of the limits of what the free version gives you, you pay for it. But we get to use it for free. Microcap is another very powerful circuit simulator that used to cost a lot of money. The company shut down. Uh, I don't know, three, four years ago. 
and they decided that they would make microcap available for free. So you can now download it, use it without having to pay that boatload of money. Uh, there are no new versions, no bug fixes. You, it is what it is. And if it works for you, use it and be happy with it. Circuit Lab is an online simulator. So no uh, software to install. You just go to the website, you create your circuit there, run it there. Uh, it's simple, nowhere near as powerful as Spice. Uh, KiCad, the uh, very popular uh, open source uh, PCB design software, in their latest release, they've also added a Spice-based simulator. So you draw your circuit, uh, you simulate it, you say, yep, this seems to work, and then you create your printed circuit board all in the same application. But today, uh, we will concentrate on LT Spice, and we will take a small detour through LC for oh. one specific uh, application. So what is LT Spice? It's a Spice implementation uh, that is that has a graphic user interface. We don't have to use punch cards anymore. It's free to use. It's not open source. Uh, it's closed source, but they make it avail available for free. Um, there is no paid for version, so there is no difference between this is what you can do with the free version, this is what you can do with the full fledged version. It's all the same. Uh, it is LT Spice, and everybody uses that. It was created by Linear Technologies, a big semiconductor uh, manufacturer, and this is where the LT in LT Spice comes from. LT was bought by Analog Devices. They did not rename it to AD Spice. It's still LT Spice as it was named uh, back in 1999 when it first appeared, but it's now maintained by Analog Devices. Big question is, why are they giving this away for free? Other people, other companies are uh, charging you a ton of money if you want to use uh, their circuit simulators. Why is this free? It comes with a lot of um, integrated circuit models from limit, uh, linear technologies and analog devices. So it has a huge library of chips that you can buy today from analog devices. And they want you to design circuits with, these, with this tool uh, that then use these uh, chips and other semiconductors, and then you send them a check every month for a million of these devices that you put in your really popular device uh, that you uh, designed and simulated with LT Spice. So it's a tool for them to make more money. Now, we don't have to send them uh, a purchase order every month uh, for a boatload of chips. We get to benefit from uh, this being available uh, for free for designers that use analog devices and LT semiconductors. Um, it has a number of different analysis modes. Today, we will only talk about about half of these. The other half is a lot more complex and more niche uh, than what we want to do today. Uh, this is only an introduction to LT Spice. If you want to do a noise analysis further down the road, there's really good documentation available. There is There are a ton of YouTube videos where you can learn how to do that. We are not talking about this today. Carl, quick question. Yep. Um, the, so linear technology, does it have nonlinear, does it have not the ability to do nonlinear aspects? or is it all just linear? Linear Technologies was just a name of a company. Uh, they, they had digital devices as well. So you can do non-linear things too. Uh, when you actually analyze uh, more sophisticated circuits, like you put a semiconductor in there, all of a sudden it becomes non-linear. So you. your circuit is already non-linear. Uh, so it, if, if you can build it, you can simulate it. I got it. So, but the nonlinearity is in the, um, uh, in a, some kind of drag and drop component that they have. Yeah. Is that correct? I got yes. it. Yes. 
and, and, and we'll scratch the surface of what is actually in one of these components. Uh, or we will look at a diode for just a split second. We won't go into how exactly semiconductors work, but uh, you will see what's in a model for a diode. <clears throat> Got it, thank you. So uh, we'll take a look at the first one, the operating point. Uh, can you see my cursor? I put a yeah. yellow uh, background around it, makes it a little bit easier to follow. You can see it. Uh, so we will look at the operating point analysis, uh, DC sweep, AC analysis, transient, which means uh, looking at something over time. Um, and we will use the step for one example. So about half of them. And the other half, again, way too specific. So this is it as far as the slides go for now. Let's jump right into the, I need this later, into the application. Um, if you've installed the application and brought it up, I hope you've seen this interface. Uh, whenever you see this background here, this graphic, that means there is no active circuit uh, that you're working on. When you start a new circuit, this will go away and we can then just place our components or probe the components. Uh, there are two versions, LT Spice is available for Windows and for Mac OS. My normal computer is a Mac, so I would use the Mac OS version if I wanted to do something with it. Because Macs are not as common as PCs, I'm using the Windows version today. I may confuse myself a few times uh, throughout the day uh, because the two versions are different. Hopefully, uh, I will recover quickly to not confuse you in the process. Um, so quick look uh, at the user interface. We have a menu bar, we have a toolbar, and we have a status bar down here. The status bar will be important because lots of useful information will show up there. And you may just miss that if you don't look down at the bottom of your window. Um, in the menu bar, we have a new schematic. We can create new symbols. We are not going to that. We can open existing schematics. Uh, our print setup, uh, we can print in monochrome and then our recently used files. Uh, we can view the toolbar status bar window, window tab, or we can remove these. We're not playing around with these today. Control panel, uh, this is the settings for the application. Color preferences, we can change those. And I did mention in my second email update components, every now and then analog devices adds new devices or fixes a problem with one. When you click on update components, it will take, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes to download everything, all the components and install them again. Uh, help, uh, there is good help available. Uh, in the application, but also on the analog devices website. On the toolbar, we have new schematic, open schematic, save schematic. The hammer is the control panel or settings. The runner here is to actually run our simulation. If for whatever reason, it keeps on running for days and days and days, we can stop it. So we don't have to wait until uh, it actually finish, finishes. We can stop that at any time. Uh, some zoom functions, we're not going over these today. Uh, cut, if you want to remove something. Copy, if you want to copy something, you can search in your schematic. Our schematics today will be very simple, so no need to search anything there. Uh, printing, and this is where it gets interesting. The wire tool, ground, we can label a net, more about this later. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, diodes. We can place these with these toolbar icons. Every one of these also shows you a shortcut key, R for resistor, C for capacitor, L for inductor, and D for diode. Now, if you wanna use other components, this is where this function comes in, the component selection. Then we have two hands here. One is to move 
a component and one is to drag a component. I will show you what the difference is. Undo, redo. And these two here uh, with those cryptic symbols, one is to rotate a device and the other one is to mirror a device. With these two, you can take any component uh, like a transistor and mirror it, rotate it, and bring it into that orientation that you see in that printed uh, version of that circuit diagram that you have in front of you that you are trying to simulate. So with these two functions, you should be okay to uh, really mimic what you have, what you wanna accomplish. And then here uh, we can add text. And then the last one is to add spice directives. We will use that quite a bit. And whenever you put your mouse cursor over one of these toolbars, uh, toolbar icons in the status bar at the bottom, you will see a description of what it does. Like in this case, it says place a spice directive on the schematic. This will be included in the netlist. Netlist is that internal uh, structure that spice uses uh, to keep track of what you're doing with your graphical user interface. So any questions so far? No. Let me bring up uh, my Explorer here. So when we go to my home folder, I should have made a shortcut for that. App, app data. Uh, so where exactly this is depends on how your computer is set up. Uh, mine is app data local. And if there you should do be... uh, percent app data percent, it will go to that folder. That's a Thank shortcut. You. Thank you. Uh, there's somebody who knows Windows. I can tell you how this works on the Mac. Uh, so there are, this is a copy of um, the LT Spice library that gets installed in your own user folder so that you can modify it. And we have two important uh, folders in here. One is called lib or lib, this is the actual library, or the library components are in there. The other one is examples. And this is where you will find a lot of really good stuff. There are two different subfolders here. Educational is where you would go to learn something. And uh, there are a ton of these in here. And you just can just work your way through them, figure out what they did, uh, how they did it. Applications is where you would find all these analog devices, chips that uh, they support and a an example of how that device is used in an actual simulation. So you can spend hours and hours in there um, looking around and learning stuff. But for oh, now, I, let's... Guys, do they only put uh chips in there if they're of their own manufacturer or do they also put other companies chips in there what what do you think what do you <laughs> yeah. think they're giving away this tool for free to make more money what do you right. think is okay. in there so it does limit um, what you can use what you can use out of the box we'll talk about uh how you can find other things later okay so uh let's do a a quick example here. Um, so I just clicked on that new uh, new circuit diagram uh, tool and it gave me some canvas to work with and you see the background image is gone. Um, I said we can add things by just hitting uh, this toolbar icon, for example, uh, if I want a resistor, I can click on that, or I can hit the R key that brings up the resistor, or third way of doing it, I can click on the component tool here, and then I type 
RES for resistor, and here it is. And I click on OK, and I get my resistor again. So we have three ways to add common components. If you want that analog devices, one, two, three, four, five chip, uh, there is no toolbar icon for that because you use that once every decade. So they didn't do that. But for the common things, we have the toolbar icons and the shortcut keys for anything else we use the component to, tool. So let's add a resistor. And I do this by left clicking and you see that something just changed. So when we, uh, let me go again. Um, let's do the cut tool, remove this. I hit escape to get out of the tool. I'm adding the resistor again. So it says R1 and R, and I place it by clicking. Something changed. My R1 is now not as clear anymore. Uh, it's because it added a second resistor that I can now move, and it's right on top of the first one. But the first one is actually now nailed down on the canvas, and the second one I can move. So I'll place a second one. I hit the escape key. I'm done with resistors. Now I need a voltage source. I hit the V key. Gives me a voltage source. This one is not on the toolbar, but it has a, sh uh, a shortcut key. I could also get it from the devices tool. I place that. And again, it switches again to the next one. So this allows me to add a number of resistors, a number of capacitors in a row without having to select the tool again. I hit the escape key again and I'm done. So now we have three devices. Um, in order to make this into a circuit, we have to add some connections, some wires and our wire tool is up here. Uh, there's a shortcut key, F3 also starts the wire tool. I click on that, you see the cursor changes. And I can go here. Carl, quick question. Yep. I missed somehow how you put the, uh, the voltage source up. I hit the V key. V, C, V. Is there, a, is there V a... as in voltage. Okay, right. Um, is there a little thing at the top that will do it too, or no? You can also go to the component tool here. Oh, yep. And then uh, let me get rid of this RES. We start to type V O L T, and we have the voltage here. Uh, so you can also select it from here. Okay. Um, now. For some somehow, I rolled my I'm, I rolled my mouse and I'm off the screen where I put everything. So now, now, now you're screwed. Uh, you need a new computer. No, no. <laughs> go 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 to the view menu, view, and say zoom to fit or hit the space bar. Zoom to and, fit. Let me try. And that. that will bring your circuit back into your view. And then how do you shrink? Oh my uh, do you have a mouse wheel? I do. When you use the mouse wheel, you can zoom in and out. Ah, OK. And then when you grab and drag your mouse, you can pan around. Now, how do I, once I set the, res so what's happening is I still have the resistor set. And every time I mouse over the screen, it wants to put a new resistor. So how do hit, I move Hit on? the escape key. Escape, thank you. All right, sorry, bad student here. I, um, I also hit the right mouse key and it stopped the inserting of the second. Yes. One and two. So, right. I, so I did it that way. There are different ways to do everything in SPICE, in LT SPICE. Got it. Okay, so are we ready for the wire tool? Yep. Um, so I, I'm using the tool button here, or I use the F3 key. And when I then move my mouse, you see that the cursor is now different. We now have these crosshairs, which allows me to figure out where exactly my connection will start. So I'm starting here. I'm clicking left mouse click. I'm going up. If I want to make a turn, I click again, I come over here, I click, and here is something cool. 
I just go straight through these devices and go back here. And LT Spice figures out automatically where my wire has to end and get connected to one of these devices or components and then uh, where it needs to start again. So this makes adding wires or connections much easier than if it, you would have to stop at every device. Say, say that step again. So let me go back. Uh, undo, 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 undo. So let me bring up the wire tool again. So I'm starting a new connection here. Yep. And you would think that when you come to this resistor, you need to stop and click. You don't, you just keep on going. You are drawing right through these devices, through these components. Okay, yep. All and right. then when you click now, <clears throat> it figures out where the wire needs to end where the component needs to be connected to that wire and then uh, where the wire needs to start again. Okay. At the top, Carl, which one is the wire tool again? It's this one. That guy right there. Okay, great. Thank you. Oops. So again, spacebar brings everything back into focus if you get lost. So we have a circuit diagram. What's missing here? An output. No, we don't really need an output to make this work. But how big is this resistor? Ah. We don't know yet. So what we do is, see how the cursor changes? It's a hand now. I right click on this component and up comes a little properties dialog where I can say the resistance of this is 1K. So it says, give me the resistance in ohm. So I don't have to specify the unit. I just say 1K. And I hit OK, and we have a 1K resistor. I right click on this one. I say, I want this to be 10K. Now, if I would have a 10 nanofarad capacitor, I would do 10N, 10 picofarad, 10P, 10 giga ohms, 10G, uh, 10 millivolts, 10M. It doesn't care about capital or lowercase, so 10M is 10 milli. So what do we then use for mega? MEG. So if I want this to be a 10 mega ohm resistor, I would have to type MEG to make this mega. Or seven megahertz would be seven MEG. That's the only thing that makes uh, working with uh, these component values a little bit more challenging because that is different than what we uh, usually uh, are used to. You have to load uh, specific components to get wire wound or film carbon. Okay. Um, or is that too far astray for right now? This is your ideal resistor. It does not have any any stray capacitance, uh, stray inductance. It's just a true resistor. If you click on the select resistor, um, there are other resistors in here. If you wanna have something that's a little bit more uh, like the actual resistor that you have in front of you, it gets a lot more complicated and we don't wanna go into that today. So for now, let's just assume we are good with an ideal resistor. So, I have my two resistors specified, 1K, 10K, and we need the voltage source. Again, I put my mouse cursor over it, right click, and I say, make this 10 volts. Looks good. Now we have a schematic. <laughs> and if you know Ohm's law, you can kind of figure out what's going to happen. So let's see what, hap what actually happens here. 
let's uh, click on the runner. Hmm. So we are getting a dialogue, edit simulation command. So before Spice can do anything, we actually need to tell it what we want it to do. And there are different types of analysis modes that we can use. Transient, AC, DC sweep, noise, uh, the ones that I had on my table when we first started with this. Let's keep it simple for now and let's use the DC operating point. It says compute the DC operating point, treating capacitances as open circuits and inductances as short circuits. Um, and down here, it's giving me the actual command that it will place on the schematic. So uh, here, for example, we have some options that we can specify for the DC operating point. There is no option. It makes it very simple. I click on OK and it just placed the command down here. Um, I'm zoomed out a little bit too much, but and I cannot zoom in right now because I got an error message. What does it say? It says, this circuit does not have a conduction path to ground. Please flag a node as ground. What the heck is that? To us humans, this is like a perfect circuit diagram. We know what it will do. We know exactly what it will do. Uh, but our computer is not quite as smart as we are, and it needs a little bit more guidance. Everything SPICE does is referenced to ground potential. So it needs to know what in this circuit is supposed to be ground. In the olden days, when you use punch cards, you use a node number of zero for ground, and that made it easy. We are not using node numbers here, so we have to tell uh, SPICE what we need to do. So up here is a ground symbol. I can also just hit the G key and I get my ground. I place it here. I hit escape. I have a ground uh, connection here and I'm now, whoops, using a wire to connect ground to the negative uh, terminal of my voltage source. And you see, I put up that wire and stopped it right here and LT Spice made a connection here. It put the dot on the wire. Carl. So now we have a ground connection. And you see our operating uh, point Spice Directive. This is what this up here is for the Spice Directives. Uh, we just placed the Spice Directive on our circuit diagram. Um, and this gives Spice all the information it needs. So now we click on the runner again. And it's doing something. We are getting output. If you're following along, are you at this point? Mm -hmm. I was okay, not, so. Carl, I was not able to move the, the ground into the pane. I'm not, oh, wait. I'm not, yeah, the ground, I think I have a ground in there, but keep going, please. So the output it created is a list of voltages and currents. And we see it says the voltage at point N001 is 10 volts. So knowing what the schematic is, I can assume that this wire here is N001. And we can actually verify this if we put our mouse cursor uh, I need to get rid of this window first because that is capturing my mouse inputs. So uh, let me just remove this. So when I now place my mouse cursor here in the status bar, you say, see, this is node N001, the DC operating point V at point N001 is 10 volts. I put my mouse cursor over here this is node N002, DC operating point V at N002 is 9.090909 volts. And down here it says, this is ground. But let's run this again to get that table again. So we see voltage at N001 is 10 volts. N002, 9.0909, and here it rounded. 
the current through resistor one is 0 0.00090909 uh, amps. Same one, same current through resistor uh, two, which is, uh, of course, logical because we have a series uh, circuit here and the current as we know in a series circuit is always the same. The current through our voltage uh, source is minus this current because of how it treats voltage sources. Mm. So it all adds up to zero in this uh, in this circuit. Uh, Dave, you, I added the op by clicking on the run button, the runner, and then it asked me which uh, operating, uh, which analysis mode I wanted to use. And I picked the tab with the operating point analysis. And that then automatically added the uh, dot op to my schematic. So those, uh, <clears throat> they've seen those all over the schematics, those little dot op, dot this, dot that, those are essentially the commands that are being run. Right, these are called spice directives, and we will actually use more of these as we go along uh, and move on to more complex circuits. So with our simple circuit here, this is easy to follow along. We know which one they are referring to with N001 because there's only one node here that should have 10 volts on it. Uh, we only have three different nodes or nets in this in the schematic. One is the 10 volts, one is ground, and then one is between those two resistors. Uh, but if you have a more complex schematic, uh, you don't know what N924 is. Uh, you have a, a million uh, components on your schematic and you do not know what exactly this, this is referring to. So is there a way we can make this a little bit simpler? And yes, there is. So when I move my mouse cursor again on one of these wires and right click, um, oh, the, here is an interesting uh, function, highlight net. Uh, again, if you have a more complex circuit, this is a good way to see what is actually connected to this one pin of your integrated circuit. And then you see this one wire with everywhere it goes highlighted. But what we want to use now is label net. So I click on that and then I can give this a name. Let's name this VCC. And then again, um, it's not placing it, it's giving me something that moves around and see this little uh, rectangle, this little square under VCC, this needs to go on the wire. This will connect it to this specific wire. The other thing we wanna know is what's the voltage here. And instead of just squeezing one of these labels in here, I'll just draw a new wire, uh, not going anywhere. And I say, this is the voltage at R2. And again, I'm placing this here. Hit escape to get rid of this. Now let's run our simulation again. So all I did was I added these two labels. And now you see it says V, VCC is 10 volts. So this makes it a lot easier to say, hey, the voltage here is actually 9.0909 volt uh, without having to scratch your head and uh, look at every single component in your complex circuit. So this makes it easier to say, I wanna know the voltage here and um, it will tell you what that is. Um, there is another trick. We can also right click here and say place dot op data label. So now it's placed the actual voltage that it just created or generated, simulated, uh, determined, and it's placing that on that wire. Uh, it's getting a little bit crowded here. Let me move this other label here out of the way. And then 
Let me move this a little bit. Now, when you look at this, this number is way too accurate. We know that if we use real resistors, uh, we don't need six digits <laughs> behind the decimal. Is there any way we can make this uh, make this look a little bit nicer? So we've learned so far when we right click on something, we can change its properties. Like we assigned the 10K value to this resistor. We assigned 10 volts to this voltage source. If we right click on this label here, we get a, a display data dialog. And down here, first of all, I can, I can pick what I want to have uh, on this wire, what I want to have printed on this wire, whether it's the voltage at resistor R2, VCC, the current through the device. Uh, but then down here, we have an expression that we can actually modify. And everywhere you see the, uh, the dollar sign is where that value that you picked up here would be uh, selected. So I can say, and there's a little programming language built in, I can say round that value times 100 and then divide by 100. And if you've ever programmed in basic back in the olden age, uh, in the young uh, days of uh, computer programming, uh, you may remember that uh, expression. So now all of a sudden we have 9.09 .09 volts. So this makes it look much nicer. I don't have to fit this really long number in here. Uh, and I know what the voltage at this point is. So uh, this... This gives me a really quick idea of how the voltages in my, the static voltages in my uh, circuit are, uh, where the operating point is. And uh, that is the most simplistic way of uh, using the SPICE simulation. Now, if you know Ohm's law, you can actually verify that this is correct. So we have a 10 volt, uh, 10 volt voltage source. Uh, we have a voltage divider here. If you remember the formula of a voltage divider, I'm pretty sure th this number will come out at the end. You can also uh, calculate the current uh, through an 11K resistor and then say, what's the voltage uh, over the 10K resistor given that current that I created, uh, that I just calculated. And again, you should come up with 9.09 .09 volts. Um, if you have your calculator ha uh, handy, uh, feel free to do that. I can assure you uh, LT spice is correct here. So uh, this was the operating uh, point simulation. Let's take a look at a different. Uh, Before you do simulation. that, Carl Heinz, if you hit mm -hmm. run right now, does your 909 turn to question marks? OK, it does. Why does it do that? Uh, you have to ask the designer. Uh, I OK, think it, I was just curious it, if I did something wrong. Yeah. No, I, I think while this uh, while this uh, dialogue is up with that table, um, somehow the, the circuit diagram is an un, in an undefined state. When you close this, it will go back to what the actual value that it just calculated is. And if you never ran this, just did the circuit, um, you would get question marks, I assume, because it's picking the yeah. last value that was for that yes. net that was ran. Okay. Yes. And we'll actually... Uh, run into this problem in just a minute. So uh, we've learned about the operating point simulation. We've learned about placing components, uh, specifying values for components, labeling nets, and putting operating point values on, uh, on wires in our diagram. 
And with that, we've exhausted what we can do with, uh, with the operating point. So let's move on and say, we want to run something different. And we are doing this by right-clicking on the SPICE directive that says .op. And this will, again, bring up our uh, dialog where we can select our simulation command. And the next one we want to take a look at is a DC sweep. And here, we need to specify a few things. First thing is name of the first source that we want to sweep. Our first source that we want to sweep, our only source that we can sweep in this circuit is V1, the voltage source one. If I would have renamed this voltage source, I would use whatever the current name is. Type of sweep, we have linear, octave, decade, list. Um, let's just do a linear sweep. And we start at zero volts, we go to 10 volts, and we do a 0 0.1 volt increment. And you see down here, it assembled this new SPICE directive, the .dc directive, with the information that we provided. V1 is the source that we want to sweep. It goes from zero to 10 with a step size of 0 0.1. I click on OK. And it just added uh, that new SPICE directive. And if I say, yeah, this is really in the way of my circuit, I can move that. As long as it's somewhere on the circuit, it doesn't matter where it is. It could be out here. It's on the same circuit diagram. So this is what SPICE will be using. So let's run this. And two things happened. One is our label that we had before turned to question marks. And the other thing is we got a chart on top of our uh, circuit diagram. So far, there's nothing in the chart. <clears throat> and we will fix that in a minute. So why is this now question marks? Because um, we did not run the operating point simulation. And this label is specifically an output of the operating point simulation. So because we did run the DC sweep, this label now is not useful anymore. And we can just use our scissors and remove it and avoid any confusion going forward. And now we can concentrate what we can do with our um, chart here. So let's hit that escape button so that we get rid of the cut function. And when I move my mouse now and I come across a wire, see how it changes to a probe? All of a sudden, we have a way to measure things. And when I click on this, it would show that information in the chart. So even though I said this is a 10 volt source, we just ran a DC sweep and we actually changed the behavior of this voltage source. And we started at zero and we came up to eight uh, to 10 volts. And this is what this line says. On this piece of wire, uh, when our voltage source was at zero, we measured zero volts. When our voltage source was at one volt, we measured one volts, which of course makes sense because this is directly connected to this voltage source. So we're not really learning anything new here. We are just verifying that our voltage source actually was swept from zero to 10 volts. Gets more interesting if we look at this point here. So. I click again here, and it's adding a second line. So the first one, green, is VCC. The second one, blue, is I cannot read this. So blue on black is really bad. What do I do? I right-click on this, and I can change the color of this. Hello? I 
can change the color of this specific uh, curve and its label. So now it's red. Uh, it's still a little bit thin and I don't know how it shows up on your computer. I can go to the settings, the control panel, go to waveforms and say, change the trace width to five. And now we have nice thick lines here uh, and no problem seeing them anymore. <laughs> so what can we read off this now? So we see when we go to, when our power source, when our voltage source is at five volts, we are at, and now look again at the status bar. In the status bar, it says X is nine, uh, 4.98 volts, so close to five volts. There's a good chance I will not be able to get exactly, to, oh, I, I can get exactly to five volts. And we have uh, a Y of 4.53 volts. So when, when our power source provides five volts here, we have 4.93 volts here at our resistor R2. So this is what I can do with the, with, uh, the DC sweep. I can actually see the behavior of something when an input voltage changes. Now, trying to figure out exactly where this cursor is, is not very easy. Uh, if I'm, especially when I have a thick line like that, uh, I don't know exactly what I'm reading. Is there a better way? Sure enough, there is. So again, I'm right clicking. And by the way, let's get rid of this green line because it's just confusing. So when you have multiple lines, multiple curves shown in the same diagram, when you double click on just one uh, wire, it will kick out all the others and will show you just this one curve. So when I right click here again, there were other things that I could do in this dialog besides changing the color. I can actually put an expression down here and I could say, take the voltage times 100 and it will do that. Uh, so now we have 540 volts here, which we know we cannot do with this diagram, uh, but we just specified that we want that voltage times 100. LT spice doesn't protect us from doing stupid things. We need to know what we are doing. The other thing we can do is we can attach a cursor. So let's pick the first cursor. And now we have a cursor that actually moves with that trace. And now I can, in this dialog here, see that at my horizontal axis, I'm at 5.003. And this is where I cannot get exactly to 5.0, uh, just because of how pixels are defined, uh, pixel width. I could zoom in and I would have a better chance to get exactly to 5.0. But we see we are measuring 4.548 volts uh, at our R2. So this is a way to put a probe on something and say, the voltage here is exactly 4.54 volts. There's more we can do with this. So we said, when we put our cursor over a wire, it changes into a voltage probe. What happens when we put our cursor over a component? Now, this may be a little bit hard to see. What you see is actually a current probe. So when I click now, I'm adding a current trace to my uh, chart. So when we look here, we have the voltage printed in red and the current printed in green, but we only see a green line. Why is that? Because the green line is right on top of the red line. So we cannot see it. Um, 
we also have now two different labels for the y-axis. We have our voltages on the left side and we have our currents on the right side. And you see the cursor changes when I go over these labels. So again, right-clicking brings up a properties dialog. So we are just under 0 0.1, no, just under one milliamp. I can actually change the labels on this axis and say, oh, let's just go to two milliamps. And let's do a tick of 0 0.25 milliamps. I click on OK. And now we have our two curves because the red one is no longer covered up by the green one. So again, my red voltages, I would read over here. And the green volt, uh, the green current, I would read over here. And just like what we did done before, I can attach a cursor to this. I'm now saying it's a second cursor, and move this up and down, and then read here what the relationship between the input voltage and the current through the resistor is. Now we know Ohm's law, so so this is not very revealing, it doesn't tell us anything new, but if this would be a, a complex circuit diagram, we could learn a lot about what it does. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is the DC sweep analysis. Any questions about the operating point or the DC sweep? Uh, real quick question, can you hover over the the line between R1 and R2? Um, you mean here? Yes. Yep. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and, and this is actually what we probed here for this red line. So I am displaying the voltage at the point VR2, which is here. So it's all connected. So I could pick any of these points here and we would always get the same result. So you set the uh, vertical axis and the current to 2MA. Yes. That's weird because you get 2,000 microamps and I get 1980 on the top. OK. I wonder why. Right click on your uh, the uh, right um, axis. What do you get? So your increments are 250 by default. That's odd. I set that to 250. Oh, okay. That's why. I, I can also set that to 500 micro. By the way, micro, you type with a U. Yeah. So okay. you, you can make this uh, axis look any way you want. If I want to go crazy um, and I'm I'm doing a lot of high power stuff, I can say, just give me a kilo amp at the top and uh, 250 amps uh, increments. I can do that. Now, I don't get anything useful out of this curve anymore. I just know that it's not going up to, I don't know how many microamps that is. <laughs> how do you, well, it says right on the side there. <laughs> how, how do you change the uh, unit? Uh, oh. Actually, I don't know. Interesting. I I was suspect I I was expecting the unit to change automatically based on what I entered yeah, here. Yeah, I would think it would have scaled. It did not. Yeah. Right. You can also sometimes this is um, important. You can have a logarithmic make yes, axis. Of course. Um, mm. In this case, it doesn't make much sense, but hey, we can create interesting looking charts. So again, we've learned about two different types of looking at the data, the operating point and the DC sweep. Let's do something different. So let's right click on this again. We just advance here so that we don't get lost. Um, in this case, let's do an a transient analysis. 
transient analysis means we're looking at this schematic over time. Let's just say, let's go from zero to five seconds. And I don't have to fill in anything else. Uh, it will use reasonable defaults for the rest. And let's just reset this and run this. So you see it put the dot tran transient analysis with an end time of five seconds down here. I'm running this. We're getting our empty graph again, and I'm putting my mouse cursor here to probe the voltage at this point. What's happening? Yeah, not much, because uh, the, uh, the voltage at this point is actually not changing over time. It's, uh, it is, uh, 9.090909 volts, regardless of whether we are looking at this when we first turn this device on or after it was on for 100 hours, it doesn't change. So in order to see something, we have to change our, our schematic a little bit. So let me get rid of this resistor here. Let me get rid of this label um, because we will use a different label. And let's just add a capacitor here. So when I put this capacitor here, you see the capacitor is actually a little bit smaller than our resistor. So I have to add a little piece of wire. And let's make this capacitor 1000 micro farad. So Scott, you asked about uh, real world components. Now, in this case, I can actually, for the capacitor, I can easily add an equivalent and series resistance or a series inductance. For the resistor, it wasn't that easy. Uh, for capac capacitors, we can do that, but we are still just working with an ideal capacitor. So let's run this and see what happens. So we get our blank uh, display again. I'm probing here. Nothing happens. Now this is odd. Uh, it's telling me that it's at 10 volts. Um, and we know this is not true. When we put a capacitor and a resistor uh, in series and connect that to a voltage source, that capacitor gets charged. So why is this happening? <laughs> When you have any circuits in uh, SPICE that use capacitors, it assumes that that capacitor is fully charged when you turn the device on. So this is what we are seeing here. It's fully charged and we are not seeing that charging process. So how can we fix that? This is where another SPICE directive comes in. We are using the SPICE Directive IC for initial condition. But before I do that, let me do one thing here. Let me give this net a label. This is VC1. Which makes it easier to put this that SPICE Directive here. So I can say V, no. Period I see the voltage at VC1 is zero. So we are telling it that the initial condition, so um, the initial condition for the voltage over the capacitor is zero volts. And when I put that information in, it makes me place this somewhere. Again, it doesn't matter where it is, uh, SPICE will find it, but it needs to be on the schematic. So with this initial condition in place, let's run this again. We are putting our probe here, and this is now the way it's supposed to look. So we see that when we first turn this on, there's no charge in the capacitor and therefore no voltage over the capacitor. And as we go through those five seconds, it gets fully charged. 
Um, you may remember that when you charge a capacitor through a resistor, the time constant, the resistance times the capacitance is important. And uh, the reason this is important because we say after five times this time constant, uh, we consider that capacitor be fully charged. And um, if you do the math, one K kilo ohm times 1000 microfarad, uh, you come up with a time constant of one second and five times one seconds would be five seconds. And we end up with a fully charged capacitor. Not really, there's still a little bit more that can fit in, but we just assume after five uh, of these time constants, it is fully charged. The unit you put in was just U or micro. Yes. I put UF in and it took that and operated the same way as yes. that. So it doesn't matter as long as it just says micro, it assumes it's a capacitor, so it's in farads. Yes. Uh, okay. You can also put a uh, microvolt in there and it will not care because it will just look at that number and then okay. look at the unit symbol. But it throws in whatever you typed as a legend next to the capacitor. Yes. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, only the U is important. Whatever comes after that, it gets ignored. Okay, so this now actually lets us look at something over time, uh, a little bit more interesting than all the other charts we've looked uh, at so far. We are we just had static uh, values that didn't change, and this is where spice really shines when you look at stuff uh, that changes over time. So we've now looked at three different analysis modes: the operating point static, doesn't change anything. Uh, we just look at where the voltages end up uh, potentially after that thing was on for 10 hours. We looked at the DC sweep when we changed something in our input. And we're not limited to, uh, to just one voltage source. We can, could have two voltage sources in our schematic. One would provide the power for our circuit, and the other one uh, would be uh, a voltage source that we change, that we sweep um, to simulate an input voltage for an amplifier, for example. And then we've looked at the transient analysis where we actually look at changes over time. Um, we'll add a little bit more to this, uh, but any questions about the three things we've talked about so far. Yeah, Karl Heinz, if if I've put in a quite a complex circuit with dozens of capacitors, do I need to set the initial conditions on each one? Yes. Hmm. I think you do. Uh, if you're but in an you AC can circuit, actually... do you have to, or does it matter? It just settles. If you have an AC uh, waveform as a source. Only if you are interested in uh, this initial condition, like uh, if, if you're charging something, that is important. So searches uh, and things like for, that, you really have to set everything, reset everything then. Right. If you have an amplifier, then no, don't don't care about that. Um, and we'll we'll take a look at that, hopefully, in a few minutes. But any questions about uh, transient analysis other than initial condition? Not about that, a real quick question at the risk of increasing time on the whole course. I right click on the directives and sometimes I can get the font size and stuff. Yeah. But I, I think I'm getting it accidentally. Uh, how do you do that? Because now I, I can't repeat the process. Um, so. What did you just you, click there? You, you click on that and you close this window and then you end up with a second oh. window. And here you have a choice to make this either a comment, meaning it's not a directive or a spice directive, and you have some formatting. That is a bizarre behavior. I didn't realize I was hitting the X instead of the yes. cancel. Yeah, um, okay. Th this is an application that was designed by engineers, not necessarily by user interface specialists. 
It was designed by engineers for engineers. <laughs> there are people um, who do both. Yeah. Yes. Wow. <laughs> But but sometimes you see uh, some of these rough edges. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. It just that's a very odd uh, behavior. You wouldn't yes. know that off the top of your head. And the fact and that it's being lot, consistent, it, it, it uh, it's like there's what, a why lot of being... this. There's a lot of this in in LT spies stuff that is not uh, either not documented at all or not documented in a way that you wish it would be. Treated as open source over a long time with engineers. <laughs> uh, this is not open source. I know, um, but so you get a lot of that too with open yeah. source stuff. So, anything else before we move on to a couple more concepts? So, let, let me just do an undo here to make this smaller again. So now I I'll throw a few more concepts at you. Don't worry if. You can't remember the exact details. You can always look up how this works in the um, LT Spice documentation on the Analog Devices website. But once you've seen these, uh, you may remember that there is something like that in the application when you get to a point where you need this. So, so far we've specified all the values here, like the 1K, the 1000 micro, uh, there's actually a different way of specifying these values. So I can use curly braces and then put a variable name in between these curly braces. And if I run this now, I will get an error message saying, hey, I can't find the definition of the model R1. So we have to tell it what R1 actually is. And we're doing this again with a SPICE directive. And we're using the param vice directive, and we say R1 is 5K. And just like before, I need to place this somewhere. And when I run this now, it gives me a different curve. Uh, so because we are charging through a larger resistor, it's charging uh, slower. And at, five, at the five second mark, we are not yet anywhere near uh, a fully charged capacitor. We are at uh, about 6.3 volts. So far, far away from 10 volts. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. But um, why is this useful? This could be useful if you have a circuit where you have four resistors, for example, that always have to have the same value. And you want to change that. And here with this parameter, we can then just change one instance and it changes the four, the values for those four resistors automatically. So it's a shortcut. But now that we have this variable in there, we can actually do something else. So let's take this. So I'm right clicking on this again. I'm closing this and I'm ending up again with that editor. So this is exactly the same behavior that we had uh, before Scott. So I need to get rid of the first dialogue in order to get to the second dialogue. So I'm using a different uh, directive now and I'm using step. And I say, change the parameter R1 via a list and use 1K, 5K, 10K, 10K, oops, and 15K. And then we run this again. And now we have actually four different charts, different curves on our chart. We have one for 1K, one for 5K. Oh, and if I would have actually put a space in between these, it would have given me four lines. So let's do this now. So now we have four different curves on our chart. One is the 1K, 5K, 10K, and 15K. So this allows me now to look at um, a circuit and 
change one component in a certain way uh, and it will give me the output for all those options that I specified. Now, in this case, it doesn't make much sense, but I could also say, uh, do not use a list. Actually, use a linear sweep uh, going from 1K to 20K with an increment of 1K, for example. So I run this again. And we get a whole bunch of curves. So it gets a little bit tricky to figure out which one is which, but um, you would usually not do something like that, um, that you end up with 20 curves on the same chart. But again, it allows us to uh, look at different, different configurations of our circuit really quick. Very powerful. Okay, so uh, I think this is as much as we can get out of this simple circuit. So let's move on to something a little bit more complex. Any questions about what we've done uh, with LT Spice so far? Can you run that again? I'm just curious I how can... fast I ran in your computer. Hmm. How beefy is your computer? My computer is not very beefy. It's a little, uh, I don't know, uh, what are they called? The, the lower yeah. grade Intel. Just curious, mine's about five years old. It's an i7 I at three and a half gigs, but the turbo's off. It runs about the same speed. I was kind of surprised. It seemed like such a simple circuit, but it takes a lot of processor yeah. power to get that to go. There's a lot that uh, Spice does in the background when when it runs simulations. So again, um, this is probably everything that we can get out of uh, the simple circuit. We do not want to change, uh, save this. Um, and I said we would do a quick excursion into um, LC. So let me bring up LC. This is what it looks like when you first bring it up. Uh, we can load old designs. We can restore the last session. Uh, we can enter parts manually, similar to what we do in, in LT Spice, or we can just do a new design. And there's a lot on this user interface. Um, save to save our configuration, get to load some design, specify a design, look at the schematic, edit, edit the schematic. Uh, for example, say, I cannot get a capacitor that is 17.35 picofarad. I have to buy one that's 18 picofarad. How does this change this? Uh, analysis and plot and a few more things. Uh, when you need any, any inductors, it also gives you winding instructions here. And I don't want to dive too deeply into this. Uh, we can pick our topology, our filter topology here. We have our low pass filters, our band pass filters, our high pass filters, our notch filters. And then when it comes to low pass filters, we have two different, uh, two different configurations, the capacitor input and the inductor input. And every time you are in doubt about what it actually means, you click on the question mark and it will show you. So this is the capacitor input. The first component that our signal encounters is a capacitor. And this is the inductor input. So the first component that our signal encounters is a inductor. And again, let's just keep this simple. We know that every time we build a transmitter, we have to put a low pass filter on the output to stay within uh, the FCC uh, uh, specification. So we just want to use a capacitor input. Let's again, keep it simple. Let's do a Butterworth. Uh, I want to go with my 3 dB point uh, to 7.5 megahertz, for example. 
And this is different than spice, so we just use M for mega. We will use a three uh, third order filter, meaning three components, uh, two capacitors, one inductor. And we want an input termination of 50 ohms, which also would be the output termination. So this is all we need to enter here. Uh, then we see the schematic. So we have a 424.413 picofarad capacitor here. Good luck finding this in the DigiKey catalog. <laughs> uh, a 2.12207 microhenry uh, inductor. Uh, good luck winding that to this accuracy. And then our 50 ohm source resistance, our 50 ohm load. And what does this look like? We are plotting this and we get the behavior of a low pass filter. So uh, no uh, attenuation here. And then we are getting to, when I click, I will actually get some information down here in this data, uh, in this area about where we are. So we are at four megahertz. Uh, we have a loss of 0 0.156 dB. Uh, we go up here to five megahertz. And at 7.5, we should be about three dB down. Yes, correct. Um, and then when we look at our like 14 megahertz point uh, second harmonic, we are yeah, about 16, 17 dB down. That is not good enough, says the FCC, at least not for anything you're putting on the air or that you're building, designing today. Um, if you have a boat anchor uh, that when it first came out was designed like that and you've not made any modifications, you can still run that. But anything that you're building today needs to be much better than that. So this is how you would define uh, a filter in LC, a really useful tool. Now let's take a look at that filter that uh, we just saw here in SPICE. And just to make things a little bit easier, um, I already created that so we don't have to walk through placing all these components uh, manually. So this is my filter. And you may remember these values from what we had in LC. Uh, we have our output resistor of 50 ohms, uh, but we don't have the input uh, resistance uh, here. So our voltage supply when we looked at it in LC, actually had a 50 ohm resistor. This is actually now built into our voltage source. We see this up here. So the serial resistance here is 50 ohms. Um, when we place a voltage source before, let me just put a fake one here. I right click on this. I'm not getting much information that I uh, can uh, modify. I have a DC value and I have a series resistance. So I can say this is 10 volts and it's 50 ohms, but that's it. Um, but we have this advanced button here and that changes our voltage source and makes it a lot more flexible. So now we can have a sine uh, wave that comes out of our voltage source with a certain amplitude, with a certain frequency. I can have pulses, I can have uh, other uh, types of shapes, but for now let's just use the sinus. And this is what I've done here, so let me get rid of this uh, one up here. Come on. When I right click on this, you see, I specified this as uh, a source, a sign source with an amplitude of one volt, 7.055 megahertz, a series resistance of 50 ohms. So this is our RF function generator that has an output resistance of 50 ohms and the filter is happy about that. 
and we are terminating this with 50 ohms as well so we should be all good we have our grounds we are now running another type of ac uh, sweep so we are running an ac uh, analysis and we are using the octave um, octave means twice the frequency or half the frequency if you know how a piano works, there's a normal regular A key somewhere that has 440 hertz. You go one octave up from that, 880 hertz. You go an octave down, 220 hertz. Uh, we can do the same thing with RF frequencies. This is not just limited to audio frequencies. Uh, an octave up would be in the 20 meter bands going from 7.055 megahertz. And uh, we can then specify how many points we want to have in that octave when we simulate this. Let's just say 100. We start at a frequency of 1 meg. We go to 30 megs. And it's changing my command here. I'm running this. And I can now probe at my output. And we see the same curve. Same shape that we just saw in LZ. Uh, in addition to that, it, it's also giving us the phase, and we can have the, uh, we can see the phase labels over here on the right side, the uh, voltage labels on the left side, and they are actually expressed in dBs because when we deal with filters, this is what we want to know. So uh, nothing different here. Pretty much the same thing we saw in LC with one difference. Um, let me put my mouse cursor here. Down in our status bar, we see that we are at 2.3 megahertz and we have a Y of 6.051 dB. Now, I may not be exactly on the line, but what the heck is that? Why do we have an insertion loss of 6 dB? Any guesses? Nobody? Mm -hmm. OK, let's try something different. So I took the same circuit, and I took out all these L's and C's. So now we have our voltage source here, and we have our load here. Let's probe what happens at this point. We have a horizontal line, just like what we would expect. Our uh, output voltage doesn't change based on the frequency. But when we now look at this line, it's also minus 6 dB. Again, what the heck is going on here? What do we have here? Well, it's a transmission line. Yes, but uh, just as far as... as uh, resistances go, we have a voltage divider. We have a power source here, a voltage source, with an internal 50 ohm resistor. And then we have a 50 ohm resistor here. Uh, so this is a, a voltage divider. And of course, at this point, we have half the voltage that we uh, have, that we created here uh, internally before that 50 ohm uh, internal resistance here. So this is what we are seeing. We see this voltage divider that gives us half the voltage. Half the voltage in dB is 6 dB down. So power, it's 3 dB. Voltage, it's 6 dB. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you may have heard about that in the past. This is why we are seeing the minus 6 dB here. This is not a uh, a bad filter with a high insertion loss. It's just telling us, I'm not an RF tool. Um, I don't really know anything about RF. What I know about are voltages and currents. And what I can tell you is at this point here, based on everything I know, it's half the voltage that went in at the very beginning. And this is why we see this minus 60 B uh, drop. So it's not really a minus 60 B drop for our filter. We don't have 
a huge insertion loss in our insertion loss in our. So, so when you say I know, you're talking about as an LT spice. Nose. As in LT spice, yes. Just to be clear. <clears throat> We as, as hams who deal with RF on a daily basis, uh, we know that a good filter uh, does not show this behavior uh, that we see on this chart. We see the behavior that we saw on the LZ uh, plot. But we also know we can just ignore the first 60 B loss in our filters when we try to simulate filters in uh, LT spice. If you change the impedance of the source, does that compensate? Like if you made it one ohm with that? Uh... That that messes up my filter because the filter is actually designed for an input resistance ohms. of 50 ohms. Yeah. So uh, you would need a different filter design. And then it wouldn't be applicable to it's your transmitter anymore yeah, because your yeah. transmitter expects a 50 ohm load. What if you change the uh, level of the source <laughs> up 6 dB? Your chart still would not show that. It would still say we are down by 6 dB oh, based on what the internally created voltage here is. Yep. So this is what it's referring to, the internally created voltage. And we can just ignore that. As, as long as we know there is a 60 B drop that's not really there, uh, we can ignore that and just analyze our filter the same way as before. So let me just double click here again. So I go to the, uh, we said 7.5 was our 3 dB point. So let me try to find, we're about at the 7.5 mark here. Uh, we are down 9 dB, and that is the 6 dB that SPICE adds plus that actual drop of 3 dB that we wanted at this point. So it requires a little bit more thinking uh, about what's actually going on in order to analyze this filter. And this is the reason I wanted to bring up a filter because uh, this cost me quite a bit of head scratching when I first uh, simulated a filter in LT Spice, and I had no clue about what was going on. And only after I did this here was I able to figure out, oh, yeah, right. Um, LT Spice doesn't really know about RF filters. So if you drive this, say you are putting in, because I've been playing around with this, a, uh, a class E amplifier and mm -hmm. then put that filter on the backside. When you look at the output of that, is that all going to change the way your gain looks and how you're, or does that go away at the point where your AC source is on the front side of the amplifier? You follow um, what I'm saying? If you're looking at the backside for... I don't think I've ever done a class E amplifier. In well, what if it's just a clean class A? I, um, it it all works out. Uh, you 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 get the right output. Well, it's an interesting thing to know because I can see where one could spend many hours and a lot of research trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Yeah, yeah. So one thing you can do is, so we've we've named nets before, so I can name this in. I can name this out. So when you uh, right click here on this chart, there is an add traces. So I click that and then I can pick any of the voltages or currents in my circuit, but I can also go down here and I can say, take the voltage at out and divide by the voltage at in. Oh, I did not place that. Did I place my in? I don't see any in. 
I don't know what I did. Okay, let's try this again. So add traces. And I say voltage add out divided by voltage add in. When you're dropping those on, you have to just be in proximity or is the cursor change? No, it needs to be right on the wire. And maybe I didn't do that. So I can move it with the move tool. I thought I... Yeah. Or just delete it and start over again. Oh, you know what? I didn't simulate it. It doesn't know about these yet. Oh, of course. Ah, yeah. That's that's my problem. Uh, so now it knows about these. But just because I put them on the schematic does not mean that the output module knows about them. And what did I now do? There's an additional space in there. So now that we actually deal with input and output and not with uh, the voltage that's the ideal voltage at the beginning of my RF generator, uh, I have the zero dB on my chart. And I go to the 7.5. And we are six, more than 60 feet down. So again, uh, half the voltage is 60 B. Half the power would be 3 dB. So this is the half power point. Okay. So long story, uh, what it comes down to is when you design, when you simulate RF stuff in LT Spice, you have to be careful about what you actually do uh, because the results are not as obvious. They're not wrong, but you need to know how to interpret them. Uh. Um, so, I wanted to do, what we've done so far was just uh, passive components. Once we add, oh, one more thing about uh, low pass filters. This is actually the low pass filter of the original NorCal NC40 um, QRP 40 meter CW transmitter. And when this was first designed in around the beginning of the 90s, this was a, a valid low pass filter on the output. Since then, the FCC specifications have changed. And somebody came up with a way of improving that filter by just adding two capacitors, C5 and C4 here, uh, in parallel with the original inductors. And when we run this. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but just uh, let's probe here and let's probe here to see the difference. So you see the, the original one has that slow sloping down. The new one goes down a lot faster and at 14 megahertz second harmonic, we are down quite a bit more than we were with the original design. So even though this is a design from uh, the early 90s, if you built this today, you have to make sure that you are complying with the new FCC regulations. So this is a quick way to figure out whether your filter is good enough. So now that we're done so, with our... So you can passive... run multiple circuits at the same time. It doesn't matter. It just treats them all on that right. sheet. Yes. Okay. And I could have used I could have used the same voltage source here, 
but I just put two identical voltage sources on my schematic. Oh, Actually, what I did clear to do it that way. What I did was I went to the edit menu, right click, edit, uh, and then duplicate. And I selected all this. And then I just plopped it down here and added those two inductors. Okay. And it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But so those two extra capacitors essentially kind of make those resonant tanks that filter yes. out and give you that dip. Yeah. Okay. How do you get rid of the, the rise on the other side? Uh, you. This is why they have two different uh, resonance frequencies here. So these create two dips. And by moving them around, you can then try to uh, find a configuration where you get the curve close to what you need. So those two, that, that right there, or is that combined with the A20? as well as part of that tank uh they, it, it's mainly this these two here but yeah there is some other influence from the rest of the yeah. circuit so it's not just these two components and again this is why you want to simulate because it's really hard to understand what exactly is going on by just looking at the individual components so you also would, want if you went to, to LC, would you get any more benefit or could you modify the circuit that way in LC? Yes, yes. Uh, you can start out with manually importing or manually defining that circuit and then uh, just adding the, the two capacitors and then modifying them and going from there. Is that file format uh, interchangeable or do you have no, to start over no, again? Completely different. Okay, yeah, I was just kind of hoping. <laughs> Okay, so um, we have 15 more minutes left. Uh, this is the last thing I want to do today because I wanted to bring in some uh, active devices. Um, we all know how a diode works. You put a voltage on in one way, it conducts, you reverse the voltage, uh, it blocks current from flowing at least on a very simplistic level. Uh, if we think a little bit more about it, we know that there is some threshold voltage that you have to be above before the diode actually does its thing. For silicon diodes, 0 0.7 volts. So uh, I have a little uh, circuit here that has a current source, a resistor and a diode. And um, the way it's arranged, it should conduct diode should conduct and we are adjusting the current we are doing a dc sweep again down here we are adjusting the current from 0 to 2 amps and then uh, we're using a step size of 0 0.01 uh, amps and when we run this and look at uh, this point here we get a curve but this is not really the curve that we usually see uh, it kind of is but it's it's like upside down or rotated, we have the voltage here and the current down here. So our 0.7 volts is up here. This is where the diode starts to conduct. I can actually do create, I, I can modify this to uh, look more like the charts that we usually understand. And I can do this by going up here, right clicking on the label and it says, I am plotting the voltage at point D. And um, I'm saying I actually want the current that is going through D1 here. Now we have the current that's going through D1 here and here, X and Y axis. And this is where we get the straight line. So I need to also go down here and say, this is not where I want I1. I actually want the voltage at the point D in this direction and now we are getting this hockey stick curve that we know from diodes so we see that at a little more than 0 0.7 volts this diode is starting to conduct and um, if, as we apply more voltage we can run more current through that diode 
where did you get that current source from? I go to the current thing and grab that symbol, but I didn't get the same okay, properties. So I go to my components and I type in current. And it goes the other way. So I use the uh, rotate function up here or control R to rotate it. So this way I'm getting that current to flow in the right direction by rotating it. I could also mirror it, but that doesn't do much with this current source, but the rotating gives me the source in the correct orientation. Does that answer your question? Yep, trying to get it to work. Okay, so again, um, by, by flipping the axis uh, on this chart, I was able to get the curve that I wanted to see. Now, this is an ideal current, uh, an ideal diode. Uh, it doesn't exist. You cannot buy this at mouse or digikey. When we right click on it, we can pick a diode. And it comes with a list. And there are actually some non uh, analog device or LT diodes in here. So 41, 40, 1N4140A is a pretty popular small signal diode. Now we are actually using that diode here. And I simulate this and we see our hockey stick is a lot flatter with a real diode. The other thing is, uh, at this point, we are running through amps through that diode. You know what happens when you run through amps to a 1N4148? <laughs> it Magic doesn't do spark. that for a long time. It, it, becomes a, it becomes an LED with a spark inside. <laughs> yes, for, for a split second. So uh, you can't really run more than, I don't know, 300 milliamps through it uh, continuously. So Spice doesn't know about that, um, which means it will do stuff that will kill real devices on a breadboard. And there is no virtual smoke coming out of this. Uh, you need to say, yeah, the current through this diode is way too high. This will not work before you actually put this into uh, on your breadboard. And this is also where we can see how a diode model actually works. So when I click on this pick a new uh, device, we see a few things here. So we have the part number, we have the manufacturer, we have the type, whether it's a silicon, Schottky, uh, Zener, uh, breakdown voltage. Oh, it gives me an average uh, current here for of 0 0.2 amps. So it does know about that. It could know about it, but again, no virtual smoke. And then this is the actual model um, or the parameters for the internal diode model that make this a 1N4148. Um, so there are a number of diodes you can pick from. Uh, 1N4007 is a popular uh, power uh, diode for for uh, rectifying. We simulate that. We get the faster rise again. Uh, this one would do one amp continuously. Uh, definitely not two. Uh, we use a Schottky diode, for example. We see hopefully the 0 0.3 volts. Let's just pick the first one that is in the list. Yep. So we start a lot earlier than the uh, 0 0.7 volts with that we have with silicon diodes. Uh, we can do uh, zenos and so on. Um, but what happens if the diode that you want to model is not in this list? So again, right-clicking, pick new diode. You can sort this list uh, by manufacturer, by type, by part number. What if the diode is not in the list? 
so we have a four n a one n four zero zero seven but what about a four n a one n four zero zero one um where would i get that this is where google comes in you just google spice diode model one n four zero zero one and hopefully you'll find something because um this diode model goes back to the beginning of spice this is not lt spice this is spice and if you would have done a, a circuit uh, on punch cards you would have used the same type of diode model so there's a good chance that between uh the 70s and now somebody came up with a model of a 1N4001. Maybe even the manufacturer of one of these diodes and you would be able to download that SPICE model on uh, from the manufacturer's website or you would find it on the LT SPICE uh, groups IO group where you can find a lot of different models. And what would you then do with this? Let me get out of this. No, I don't have that in here. Okay, so we need to do this. Uh, a little bit different. So um, what you would do is Let's say you find a model for the diode that you want, and it would look just like that. Dot model, the name, and then D to indicate that it is using the internal diode model, and then a string of parameters. So what you would do is you would go in here. Um, so the top one, D1, is the reference. It references this diode as the first diode in the schematic. The D down here is actually the model. And we saw that change when we switched it to a uh, 1N4148. I'm calling, that, calling this my diode. And if I could type, it would actually spell that. If I run this now, it will complain that it does not know about this model. Um, yeah, and we get an error message. We'll just ignore this for now. So I would add a new SPICE directive. And I would say, this is model my diode D, and then that string of parameters. So because I didn't specify anything, it's still using an ideal diode, but, oh, come on. But it is now using the diode that I specified. So the type my diode uh, using that model that I put into the SPICE directive. And this is how you would uh, add things that don't come from analog devices into your own uh, schematics. Now, what we haven't talked about is more complex uh, things to place into your schematics, like an operation, an op amp, or uh, there are a lot of um, switching power supply, integrated circuits that you could use <clears throat> and design your, integrated, uh, your switching power supply this way. And um, they are done using the concept of sub-circuits that you encapsulate into a wrapper so that SPICE can then use that and model it. But that is a little bit too much for today. So this was just about the basics of SPICE. And I hope that I was able to convey that SPICE is a useful tool that you can use for circuit analysis uh, of simple circuits, more complex circuits, uh, and really, really complex circuits if you have the time to run uh, such a simulation for hours and hours or days and days. It will do it.
but it may take some time. And if there's any interest, uh, we can certainly add another session that goes into more depth and uh, talks about the more advanced concepts of SPICE. But all I wanted to do today was give you uh, an overview of what it can do. And uh, I hope that I accomplished that. Very good. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's really interesting. If we would have been a little bit faster, I would have had some amplifiers that we could have looked at. Um, I would have uh, shown you how to simulate a crystal oscillator. There are no crystals in SPICE, so you have to make your own crystal uh, or at least convince SPICE that what you just put on that schematic is a crystal and behaves like a crystal. And there are ways to do that. But that could be stuff for another session. So if there's any interest in doing that, I can certainly add another session next month sure, or later. I would vote for another session. I mean, I, I got way behind and I'll go back to the recording and I'll redo everything. But I, I would tune into another session. Absolutely. Likewise. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. Okay. Some stuff is like, yeah, that's pretty easy. Other stuff is like, whoa, slow down there. A little yeah. bit. One thing when I did tried to build that diode circuit, my graph, the uh, x axes, is not what I want it to be. And I was wondering how you got that way. So maybe you can save that for another time, I guess. So uh, what I did, let me just stop the sharing again. Okay, so I moved my my uh, Zoom toolbar so often that I don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> um, let me bring up Spice again. Um, so no, I, when... I, I got it to work now. It's like the first time I tried to change the uh, axes, it seemed to keep wanting to go back to volts. So what I did was um, I first changed the the overall plot behavior by right clicking on the plot name up here where it says this is a voltage at point d i right clicked on that and i said i don't want the voltage at point d i want the current at um that is running through diode d1 okay so then it automatically changed the legends yeah yeah, so now I'm plotting the current through D1, but I'm also plotting the current through D1 here. So I, I'm plotting the value against the same value, and that is why I'm getting this straight line. So the next thing I did was, so the current over D1 uh, through D1 is here on the y-axis. Now I want to change the x-axis. I right-click here. And I say, this is where I want the voltage at point D. Now I have the voltage down here and the current up here. So to flip the axis, you rename them. Yes. OK, that answers the question. Very helpful so you don't sit there lost. Because I kind of played around with it and didn't end up with that result, but I think I was trying to listen and play at the same time. Yeah, the recording will be very useful. I know this was a lot of information, but I thought we needed that much information yeah. to really wrap it up so that you can say, okay, I know how I can do simple circuits now in SPICE, and I can now take this and go from there, look at the more... Uh, sophisticated ex ex sophisticated examples that come with SPICE or find other models, find other examples uh, on the internet or on YouTube because there's plenty of information out there. Okay. Well, thanks. Any for other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, I was just wondering about something. I mean, I thought of this as a um, a tool for designing circuits or for experimenting to try and understand what a component would do. Mm -hmm. It occurs to me it might be useful for um, 
fixing an existing piece of equipment, uh, does it get used in that way? I mean, do people sort of say, well, I'm trying to fix this this radio. Um, let me let me basically model it and then work out what should be happening. That's that's something that I've done in the past. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, and oftentimes you don't have to simulate the whole right. uh, radio. Like, example, um, I had a problem with, where is my, with, with the oscillator in my NorCal 40. And I lost my zoom again. So I took the schematic and I put it into uh, LT Spice. And the actual circuit uses uh, a very cap here. So a diode that acts as a capacitor. And I just said, I'm just putting a regular capacitor in here. Okay. Um, in the middle of the range that it can do. And then I simulated that. Problem with oscillators is when we simulate this, first of all, it will run for a long time. You see this? Oh, it actually did it. Uh, when I then go at the output, you see there's some strange stuff, stuff happening at the beginning. And here I can then look at the output. Yep, I see what the voltage is uh, at what the frequency is supposed to be and uh, then go from there and if i don't find this in my radio then i know there's something wrong with this and um, actually while we have this up there's something really interesting happening here so when we look at the very beginning oh, yeah. this is not oscillating for a long time um, actually, 15 microseconds is not that long, but there's a reason it's actually starting up that quickly. But there's nothing it does at the beginning, and this is pretty common with oscillators. When you try to simulate an oscillator in SPICE, uh, it may never oscillate, even though when you build one with exactly the same component values, it oscillates without a problem. The reason is, if we think about what is an oscillator, uh, it's an amplifier, with a feedback. So it's feeding its output back in phase uh, into the input of the amplifier. And if there's nothing to amplify, there's never ever anything coming out the output. And therefore, there will not be a feedback. So if you have a perfectly quiet circuit without any noise, that thing will never oscillate. Got to give it a kick. And this is what I'm doing here. I put a voltage source in here uh, with a relatively high series resistance of 10K, and it just gives you a kick. So when we look at this here, at this point, uh, actually, it doesn't show up. It's so short, it doesn't show up. But that's what this does. Mm -hmm. So it gives it a kick so that my oscillation actually starts. And once that thing is going, that voltage source here is not doing anything anymore. It's just a one nanosecond uh, kick. And it's so short that it doesn't even show up. Hmm. Well, that's kind of a, what, a modified Colpitz oscillator? This is a Colpitz, yes. Hmm. What, is the, what is the reason for C49 and... C underscore D8. C underscore D8, is that your VAR actor, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, there's some decoupling. Uh, there is a, uh, a diode here to limit the, uh, the voltage to get a more uh, uniform output voltage. Yeah, and that, this is, and that doesn't distort the signal at all. No, this is exactly what I was thinking about. So I, I look at a schematic of something I'm trying to fix, and I think, what the heck is this component there for? 
So presumably you could take D9 out of this and run it and see what happens and say, ah, yep. that's why I need that there. Yeah. So yep. I just use the cut tool here, snip that out. I leave everything else in place. I'll run it again. Oh, yeah. So you see the voltage now is much higher. Yeah. And I may not need that higher voltage, and that high voltage may actually fluctuate depending yeah, so on other things. It. Yeah. So it's essentially yeah. a limiter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Interesting. A lot of good information here. Yeah. So while, yes. while, if you have one more minute, um, I can actually show you one more oscillator. Um, So this is the crystal oscillator that I was talking about. And I'm using a, uh, a capacitor here as a crystal. And when you look at the values that I assigned to this capacitor, I have an actual capacitance of 0 0.01267 picofarads, almost nothing. I have a series resistance of 6.3 ohms. I have an equivalent series inductance of 20 millihenry. I have a parallel resistance and I have a parallel capacitance. Um, there are motional parameters that you can measure for a crystal. And these are the numbers that you would come up with. Do you have to and, find that someplace? I know that's essentially the LRR, LRC equivalent, yes. right? Uh, you can find these uh, for a few selected crystals, but there are ways to measure this without not too much effort. And when we simulate that, this one will run for a long time. So does R1 mess with that then differently than it would be for a crystal? Uh, no, um, it actually does not. It behaves exactly the same way as it would with a crystal. So uh, we have our output. I look at the output and it looks good. Um, Oh, here's a, another little tidbit. If I want to know the output frequency, I can watch the status bar at the bottom. Oops, I draw this line here, and it tells me in the status bar, we have a difference of 104 nanoseconds. And then in parenthesis, it's giving me Ooh. that expressed as a frequency. So this... Uh, the, the crystal that I'm trying to simulate here is a 10 megahertz uh, crystal. So we are close to that. There's another way you can get to that frequency and that is right clicking here and then go to the view and select FFT. That, that's the next thing I was gonna ask. <laughs> yes, uh, it's all built in. So uh, we can then, now uh, Zoom is again messing with me. Come on, go away. I cannot move the window and I cannot there's move a, the zoom. There's a bar. sweet spot to grab that thing. I've had problems with that myself yeah. in the past on Windows. Okay, got it. So this is the FT, FFT output. And when I put my cursor here uh, in the status bar again, it says 10.025 megahertz. So we see that peak in at the 10 megahertz point. So oh, FFT yeah, is built mind. into SPICE. But uh, the interesting part here is I don't have that kick here. So that thing actually needs to start to oscillate by itself. And when we look at this, it doesn't look like there was anything at the beginning. And this is because we're actually not looking at this from the very beginning. Uh -huh. We are looking at the stop time of 8.5 milliseconds and we are starting to save data at eight milliseconds. So there's eight milliseconds of simulation that we don't see here. And this is one way to make your FFT a little bit more accurate because you don't have the stuff at the beginning messing with you. If we just look at the yeah. first half a millisecond, there's nothing going on, absolutely nothing. What about four milliseconds? Oh, look. Starting. 
slow oscillation starting. What's really what? slow. What started it? Just noise. Um, so we can't actually, introduce noise in here? Spice actually does have noise in the system. Okay. And you can do a noise simulation. So you can actually say, I really want to know how the noise performance of this circuit is. So now we are slowly getting up to the voltage that we want. And um, as you can see, oh, this is why this halt function here exists. I'm actually simulating four seconds. I didn't put the milliseconds in there. So be careful. It wants its units and its its uh, prefixes. So uh, yeah, this is what when you just look at the first uh, few milliseconds of this, you would say my oscillator is not working. And then you just let it go, <laughs> and eventually, that little bit of noise that you have in the circuit will just. Uh, trigger the oscillation to start. But if you don't want to wait, you just kick it. You just put that pulse uh, voltage source here and you do a one nanosecond spike and that will take care of it. Can you do uh, thermal variations and things like that? Yes, there is a, a thermal simulation. Now, again, no virtual smoke. If you fry your 2N2222, no, no. uh, you won't know that you fried it. You'll know when you put it on the breadboard. Yes. Yeah. So again, uh, when, we click on, when we click on this, uh, we see uh, the analysis modes. And there is a way to get a thermal analysis tool. Yeah, these tabs are they they're mutually exclusive, right? So yes, you're doing it's one yeah. or the other. So you have to pick which one you are interested in. And if you want two of them, you run two simulations. Sure. One after the other. And you can just drop two of those onto the page there. You can, uh, but uh you would have to comment one of them out. Okay, so it'll only run one at one at a time. So let's go here. Um, I could do an up here, and then I put an is that asterisk. a little? What's oh, an asterisk to comment? Yeah, the asterisk is the uh, what you call it comment symbol. So now we're doing the operating point simulation, and we get the operating point output. And if I'm done with that, I click on that again. Oh, I need to close this one first. Right click on that one again and move that. Come on, where am I? Now the sun is coming through my window and I'm blinded by. Well, we see it nicely. Yeah. So now I switch it back to the transient analysis and we are running that. And you see this takes a while to run. Did you have a measurement point yet? You have to put that in. No, no, I don't have that yet. It's simulating the whole circuit. How do you know and when it's done? When you look at the status bar. Oh, it's down there. So one way you know is when you don't have the uh, chart up. So we just run this. Oh no, actually it, it's bringing this up right away. But, oh, this time it was done much faster because apparently it just remembered that I oh, didn't change anything. It. Yeah. So uh, it has all the voltages, over all the voltages, all the currents over time stored and you pick what you want to look at after it's done with the simulation. And it remembers it as long as you don't close the measurement tab. Yep. Right. Hours of playing and fun. 
Yes, there's a lot in here. And again, you can use it for a number of different purposes. Um, figuring out whether something that you designed will actually work. Uh, taking a design that you have to figure out how exactly it behaves, how it would behave if you change something. Or if you want to fix something, put that circuit off your radio in here and see if, uh, if you can find out what's wrong. Now, if your radio happens to use tubes, you still can use this. You just will have a harder time finding the tube models. They're out there, uh, not for every single tube out there, but uh, this is where you then need to use a data sheet and try to figure out what you need to change of an existing tube model in order to make it work for the tube that you actually have in your hands. Well, I'm for another session, so. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Maybe after you post this up and announce it a month or two from now. Yep. Yeah, I need some time to prepare something. Uh, this was a lot of work for today. And I bet. I thank you for very doing good, it. Then. Thank you. You're thank you, Carl. Very thank good. Thank you for doing it. Thank you, Carol Heinz. You this was are fascinating. very welcome. Um, go out and use it. Oh, one more thing. Uh, as I mentioned in my email, uh, we do have a group, SIO group for RARA Academy specific topics. And I created a hashtag for that. So if you want to discuss anything you're doing, if you want to ask any questions, um, sign up for this group. If you are already signed up, just use the new hashtag LTSpice when you post your question or your comments. And uh, you can then subscribe to different hashtags or unsubscribe from hashtags. So if you're not interested in any antenna simulation related topics, you can unsubscribe from 4 neck 2 and only see the discussions about LT spice. Cool. Okay. Okay. Have Thank a you. great thanks. rest of your Saturday. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks again, thanks. Karl Heinz. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye for now.